Welcome everyone to Cheese In Depth. I'm Michael Landis and today we are going to explore the world of English Blue Stilton along with a couple other cheeses and we're really fortunate to be able to have two of the most intelligent and dynamic men uh, from England to be able to talk about uh, this loved this love cheese. And uh, we're also going to do a little pairings with them at the end. But uh, I honestly want to believe that this is the uh, most and best information that you could ever receive when thinking about uh, learning more about English cheeses and English blue students, uh, Stilton in specific. So I'm not going to continue to talk. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kim and Martin. And uh, they're going to walk you through this. And then we'll be tasting some cheese. So Kim. Martin. Thank you for the introduction, Michael. I'm not sure about um, the intelligence, certainly enthusiastic. We'll um, hopefully bring a lot of our enthusiasm for Stilton across this afternoon. So to introduce myself, um, I joined Clawson by accident some 40 years ago, leaving school, not quite sure what I wanted to do. Got a summer job working in the laboratory, technical department, and from there, I was encouraged to have a go at cheese making and spend a lot of my time in my formative years learning the craft of making Stilton cheese and grading the cheese, judging the quality, understanding how to make a good consistent Stilton. And for my sins, I had a short spell for a few years in the commercial department, um, selling the product, meeting customers around the world, but saw the light and came back to the production. So I hope to share some of my knowledge and skill and enthusiasm for Stilton with you this afternoon. Over to you, Martin. Thank you, Kim. Um, I'm Martin Harris. I've worked at Clawson for nearly 23 years now. Uh, I've been involved in the food industry since I was about 20. So probably about the same time that dinosaurs rule the earth. But uh, I've enjoyed my time at Clawson. The dairy industry is, is, a, is a fabulous industry as far as I'm concerned, but uh, the last 15 years I've been responsible for the export side of the business at Von Clawson, uh, with particular focus on the USA. The USA is a very, very important market for us. Um, about 70% of the products that we export um, go to the US. So I've spent a lot of my time there over the years at the various food shows, um, and we work closely with a number of distributors. The business now export directly to the USA. So we load our own containers at Clawson. These are based on orders that our customers send to us. The stock is made against the order, so it's fresh with the best shelf life. Uh, it's shipped from here directly to Port Elizabeth. The crossing takes around 14, 10 to 14 days. Uh, and then the product is picked up by the distributors, um, usually within three or four days of the container being cleared. So the stock that's arriving in the U.S. is absolutely optimum in terms of its quality. Thanks. What I'm going to try and do in the next 30 to 40 minutes is walk you through a little bit of history of cheese making and Stilton and how we make Stilton today and how that contrasts against how it was made in the 1930s and the 1940s. And after I've walked you through that and give you a little bit of knowledge about Stilton, um, we'll do a tasting and talk about the different age profiles, the products, and as Michael said, some of cheese that are strongly associated with Stilton and Long Clawson. It's always very difficult, particularly on these virtual type formats, to know exactly what everybody knows. So I do apologise to any of you out there that are cheese experts and probably know a lot more about Stilton than me, but for those that probably don't, it's just worth starting very quickly on the first slide, just the basics. So, you know, cheese making was one of those accidental finds by tribes in the Middle East where they were storing milk from goats and ewes and camels in animal stomachs and moving around during the day from camp to camp when they got to wherever they were stopping at night, went to pour the milk out. And instead of milk coming out of the animal's stomach, they very quickly found they was getting curds and whey. So from there, cheese making started to progress thousands of years ago. And it's very well documented how that moved from the Middle East and through Central Europe and spread. 
towards Britain and one of the big and important vectors to that were people like the Greeks and Romans. The Greeks developed cheese making, it became an essential part of the diet. The Romans did. The Romans realized the nutritional value of um, cheese and it became a key part of the diet of the Roman emperors and their legions. So then moving on to Stilton and English market. Yeah, so how did that actually get to Britain? So the Romans um, came to Britain and they brought cheese making with it and the Saxons also then started to develop cheese making in communities in the UK and the Norman conquest saw the first real developer of cheese making in these uh, lands. They saw the emergence of the shepherd looking after ewes. So you've got to think at those times it was largely sheep and not cows and the dairy maid taking that use milk and starting to make cheese and the monasteries in this country had a big and important part to play in cheese making the monasteries were closed communities and the monks had uh, learned their craft of producing wines and cheeses and very much um, then took those on to develop and during the abolition of the monasteries the monks then went into the community and took those cheese recipes with them and developed and very much cheeses in the 16th century came to be known by the areas that were produced so cheddar and double gloucester a lot of them by location yeah so how did that um, manifest itself into blue stilton and what do we know there's no single absolute definitive um, recipe for um, stilton uh, but what we do know that somebody, a famous English writer traveling around the UK called Daniel Defoe in 1722, stopped at a village, which is about 50 miles from here, and talked about eating a blue cheese. And over a number of years, he stopped there and stopped talking about this blue cheese from the village of Stilton and started talking about Stilton cheese. The village was pivotal. It was a coaching stop on the way from London up to York and Edinburgh and people would stop overnight in the hostelries and would eat and buy the Stilton cheese. And what we do know is there are two documented accounts. There's a big um, hall not far from Long Clawson called Quenby Hall and the cheese maker there or the housekeeper produced a blue cheese known as Lady Once Cheese and that became to be known as Stilton. And there was a very famous person called Francis Paulet that developed a recipe for Stilton cheese and she sold it to the innkeepers in the village of Stilton. So the village of Stilton started to um, wane um, as coaching came to a halt as uh, the railways started to emerge in the 1840s. So the local makers around this area in Leicestershire started to hold cheese fairs and you can see on the sepia picture on the slide is an actual picture of the cheese fairs. So the cheese makers would actually take their ways along to these cheese fairs two or three times a year. Bit of straw, bit of hay on the ground, bit of sackcloth in, stack the cheese up and the buyers would come up from London on the train, try the cheese, negotiate with the cheese makers, buy their cheese and some young lads would put them on a handcart, take them up to the railway station, and that's how the sales for Stilton started to really, really develop with the emergence of railways. And towards the end of the 1890s, 1900s, Stilton production started to move away from farmhouses. There was over 3,000 farmhouses in Leicestershire alone producing Stilton, more to cooperate onto a, a group of farmers producing it in a single area or a village. Now we talked a little bit about the emergence of cheese making in the UK and how that was evolved by the Saxons and Romans and monasteries. How Stilton, really the origins were not exactly sure and that moved through onto farmhouse production in this area and then started to move from the farmhouses into small dairies. And around 1911, 1910, people in this area, this village, um, started to get together and talk. And in 1911, a group of 12 farmers decided that they was going to cooperate and start to make cheese. So 
they formed Long Claws and Dairy, and we're still on the original site. And we started the production of Stilton cheese on this site in 1912. Then in our history, you know, there's lots of interesting things happening, but today, you know, a couple of interesting pointers. There was no cheese production during the Second World War due to national rationing. Only a cheddar could be produced. And we recommenced still production straight after the Second World War in 1949. And one of the accolades that we got, we won the best cheese in the London Dairy Show, the first show held after the Second World War. And in 2008, through acquisitions and joining together with other manufacturers, Long Clawson became the single biggest producer of Stilton in the world. So, so Michael's just going to put a short video that will play for a couple of minutes and it gives a, a decent introduction of Clawson. Long Clawson Dairy is a British farming cooperative based in the village of Long Clawson near Melton Mowbray in the heart of the Leicestershire countryside. We're best known for our famous Blue Stilton, which has protected designation of origin status and can only be made in the three English counties of Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire to a strictly controlled method. We also produce other award-winning cheeses, such as Blue Shropshire, Smooth Blue, Aged Leicestershire Red and a range of sweet and savoury additive cheese blends. We have a dedicated, committed and enthusiastic workforce who take pride in what they do within the business and for the business. Over 40 farms in the Leicestershire, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire areas supply us with millions of litres of milk every year. Our ethos is one of sustainability we never lose sight of our responsibility to deliver returns to our farmers and are committed to continual investment in facilities, ensuring prosperity for years to come. All our farms are Red Tractor accredited and independently audited. Red Tractor is a food scheme that assures high standards of food safety, animal welfare and environmental protection from farm to pack. The Red Tractor logo is the leading quality food mark in the UK. At the heart of the small Leicestershire village of Long Clawson, our head office is home to expert staff dedicated to producing our famous Blue Stilton. Our innovation centre is also located here, where we develop new cheese like our award-winning aged Leicestershire Red, which is cloth-bound, buttered and matured for up to six months. Once the milk reaches our dairy, it's pasteurised and then pumped into vats. Starter culture and rennet are added, turning the milk into curds and whey. Penicillin Rock 40 is also added at this stage, which will eventually give the cheese its distinctive blue veins. The whey is drained and the curd is cut into blocks and salted. It is then milled and placed in cylindrical hoops. The hoops are stacked and moved to a hastener room where they're turned daily for five days. Turning ensures even distribution of the curd. On day six, the cheese is removed from the hoops and wrapped in film to help support it. It is held in a cool room for approximately three to five days and then the film is removed as the cheese is able to stand on its own. Then it's moved to the maturing room where it's turned weekly. During weeks 6 and 7, the cheeses are skewered by stainless steel needles to activate the growth of the famous blue veins. After a second skewering, the cheeses are left for 7 days to ripen. The cheese grader checks the progress of the cheese by removing a core of the stilton with a grading iron. This allows a cross-section of the cheese from the centre to the crust, which is assessed for maturity and openness of texture and determines if the cheese is ready for customers. Our Stilton is dispatched in many formats, from whole cheeses to pre-cut portions. The portions are cut and wrapped in our state-of-the-art packing facility, 
where intelligent cutters slice the cheese to a specified size before it's boxed and shipped to our waiting customers. The final product is a perfect blue Stilton to take center stage on your cheese board. All our additive cheese is made at our Bottisford manufacturing facility. Here we combine different base cheeses with fruit or savory additions to deliver something different for the cheese board. It is either portioned by our state-of-the-art cutters and packed into trays, or delivered as a larger piece for slicing on the deli counter. One of our very first blended cheeses continues to be built at Bottisford. Our Huntsman cheese encases layers of blue Stilton in a double Gloucester outer, and it's all hand-constructed. Long Clawson Dairy has been a way of life for generations of farmers. We're a modern company with a long, proud history. We're part of the farming heritage of England, creating outstanding products that continue to stand the toughest test of all, the test of time. So we're just going to step through a few slides reasonably quickly. They're just photographs. It just gives a sense of how the, the cheese was produced in the earlier years around the Second World War. Milk used to be delivered in churns. There was no bulk collections. The farmers would bring the milk in 10 gallon churns. In the very, very early years around the First World War, there'd be 17 gallons or 21 US gallon churns made of marge steel and need two people to lift and the farmers would bring the milk in and take the weight back. The cheese was made in 80 gallon pans and if you look at the bottom right hand corner there you can see the tin pans that the cheese was made and the cheese curds would be ladled into the cloths which you can see in the ceramic sinks and then hung up to drain overnight. And then around 1940 just before um, the or around the turn of the Started the Second World War, um, Clawson produced the cheddar and was encouraged to move away from the ceramic sinks and the, the, the 80 gallon pans and to modern cheese vats. And that's a picture of the 500 gallon and 800 gallon cheese vats. And the process was very much the same, but the milk was processed in larger quantities. Curd from Stilton is slightly different to most cheeses. A lot of cheeses like cheddars from the milk going into the vats to milling the curd is anywhere between three to four hours. Fast acidification. Stilton needs to be very slow and low acidification to produce a blue cheese, which I'll touch on in a short while when I go through the production method. Um, our curd needs 19 hours in the vat or drain. And then on the second day, the curd is milled and we dry salt and hand mix the salt into the curds. And after the cheese have stopped in the hoop, and again, I'll be able to explain it in a little bit more detail in a few minutes, the cheese takes five days to form its shape, and then it is removed from the hoop, and the surface is sealed to allow the formation of a natural coat, which is very important and intrinsic characteristic of Stilton cheese. And there you can just see in 1950, old wooden cheese shells, which have fallen out of fashion in the last few years, but are starting to gain a lot of popularity with small cheese makers. People are starting to understand that they do have a good part to play in cheese production. The cheese sits on the shelves and turned to give even shapes and air dried over a matter of five to six weeks. And that shows one of our larger cheese stores in 1970s and those cheese rooms held 12,000 cheese each. The cheese just lined up in regimented rows and just gradually aging over six weeks before we pierce the cheese to allow the process of mold development. Just moving on to just bring you up to date, that's a picture of our current head office and our current chairman. Everybody at Long Clawson that's on the board of directors are a, a farm producer, produce milks to supply to the co-op. So we're still an active farmers co-op today, which is the core of everything we do at Long Clawson. 
So just quickly, I won't dwell on this, but we are a farmer's co-op. We've got a strong sense of ownership and, you know, we're here today to make the best return we possibly can for our farmers. And we believe we can do that by making really good quality Stilton cheese. We bring the milk in from 39 local farms, 70 million litres in uh, English money, so to speak, but 55 million pounds of milk for US. Our profits are shared with the staff and farmers and our turnover is about 70, US, 70 million US dollars and we employ 400 people. It's a very, very labour intensive process. There's still lots of handcrafting to manufacture Stilton cheese. We produce about 65% Stilton and Blue Shropshire and I'll touch on Blue Shropshire shortly. The blended cheese is the manufacture of cheese where we add flavours and fruits and half of those use white stilt as a blend and Rutland Red or aged Leicestershire again I'll talk about shortly that is historically always been linked with stilt cheese. UK we supply all the major supermarkets Tesco, Asta, M&S, Waitrose 20% of our production we export around the world there's virtually no continent that we don't reach and we supply a lot of customers in the US. Martin, did you want to just briefly touch on the customers we supply in America? Yeah, certainly, Kim. Um, we, we traditionally uh, developed our business through wholesalers, but obviously with the march of the, the bigger supermarkets in the US, uh, more and more of the delis now offer a, a big range of, of, of imported cheeses, uh, particularly cheeses from Ireland, uh, from France, uh, Dutch cheeses, Italian cheeses, and uh, English cheeses have, have gained provenance over the years as people have tried the product and enjoyed them. And I think our standing, as, as you said earlier, Kim, as being a farmer's cooperative, it's really important because we have absolute traceability from the, the animal and the milk quality right the way through to production. We manage the shipping. Uh, we work very closely with our distributors and with the retailers mm -hmm. to uh, ensure that we get the best product in the market for the consumer. It's really important. Yeah, as Martin said um, a minute ago, we believe it's intrinsic being a farmer's co-op and it, it's part of our core being. And one of the big advantages that it gives us as a dairy is all the milk comes from those 39 farms. So as Martin mentioned a minute ago, we need exactly where the milk's coming from we work with our farmers um, and we believe that's very important and that's a core part of what you get when you buy cheese from Long Clawson. So just moving on, the, um, that's the Vela Beaver, it's where we are, there's some nice pictures there of the cows across the uh, Vale, it's rolling grassland, it's not hilly and this area in the Vale of Beaver lends itself suitably for growing grass and the production of Stilton cheese. The grass grows slowly and we believe it gives a different type of grass and minerals and leads to the quality of milk that makes excellent Stilton cheese. And in the centre top pitches there, Beaver Castle, that's at the end of the Vale of Beaver and that is key and it appears on some of our publicity and um, is key part of this locality. Yeah, so just going back to the farms, one, one thing that we have done with our farms is introduce the animal welfare standard. One thing we've become very aware of talking to our consumers, as Martin said, he attends US trade shows and sometimes I accompany Martin. We talk to our customers in different countries in the UK. And one thing that we know is that our customers are getting more and more interested in where the products come from who makes the products and exactly how the animals are looked after and to make sure the animals have a good life. And that's really key to us. And we introduced with our farmers four or five years ago, Clause and Care 365, which is just very basic that we ensure our farmers look after their animals 365 days a year to a very high animal welfare standard. And we pride ourselves on doing that. Yeah, so we talked earlier that we've got 39 farms. Uh, the milk is very local. Um, the furthest farm we have to go to is 25 miles. Um, 
We don't have any third parties involved. We collect our own milk from the farm. So it never leaves the ownership of Long Clawson. So if the farmers own the dairy, technically it remains in our ownership from the second the milk leaves the cow to the cheese we deliver to you as customers. We make sure it's all hormone free. We don't allow our farmers to do anything other than try and produce the, the milk naturally. Um, it's not organic, but it's produced as naturally as possible, as close as possible to a organic standard. We test all the milk we receive before we use it. Um, and we're trying to introduce a high grazing standard. We've now got 95% uh, of our farms actively grazing with a view of producing milk only from grazed milk in future years. Um, the milk is produced from different breeds of cow but we think that's less important than the farmer concentrating on the quality of milk paper. Yeah, so just a nice picture of calves. Um, but it's again, it's very emotive. Um, we don't allow farmers to put calves in single calf hutches and lots of people would have probably read the publicity that's going around the world. Some big farms, you know, isolate the cows at birth. We make sure the cows are kept in groups and have lots of social interaction and are raised to very high standards. Yes, and you know, introducing the standards is very good for animal welfare, but it is also very good for cheese making because what happens on farm is important to the cheese making because good quality milk to good hygiene standards is the very start of producing a good Stilton cheese. So it's a win-win. The consumers see that we run farms or police our farms to very high welfare standards at the same time doing that we make sure the farmers are doing it to produce good quality clean milk to start the production process to make good stilton yeah we've mentioned um, we collect our own milk we don't allow any third party to touch it we never let that milk out of our control so we could we can move over that there's another picture we just glance over that as and flick onto the next slide we collect all our milk from the farms every day fresh so we don't um, bulk store milk on farms and we try to process all the milk from farms within 48 hours of leaving the cow. As far as practically possible we'll try and do that in 24 hours. So moving on to the manufacture of Stilton cheese. Um, there's some interesting things. Stilton is a protected trademark. A group of Stilton manufacturers in the 1960s applied to the High Courts in the UK for a um, certificated trademark for our products. I think initially from everything I've read there was almost left out of court in 1960 but they didn't get downhearted. They persevered, they persuaded people that there was something very very special about Stilton and very unique. They amended their application and reapplied in 1963 and they was a granted a certificated trademark in the UK for the production of Stilton. And what does that mean? And I'll talk through that. But the cheese can only be produced in the three shires of Leicestershire, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. It can only be made in those three shires and the milk must be pasteurised. So they're, they're the key starting process. We've talked and I'll touch on it again in a minute. It's got to be slow acidification. So you can't produce a fast Stilton cheese. It's got to be slow acid production. It must be in the vats overnight to give the right texture to produce the cheese we know today. Very importantly, we mustn't press the cheese. It's not a pressed cheese. There's lots of cheese that are pressed and you're probably all familiar if you buy cheese as a consumer or a wholesaler or a retailer that are pressed cheeses. They're very uniform in their presentation and shapes. Stilton isn't. It's a very natural cheese. It's allowed to form naturally in hoops, so it will have different shapes and slices. It will have different appearances, but that is because it's natural and we haven't applied any pressure or cultures to the outside of the cheese. It must be round. The thing to fruit, mention, so you'll yeah. never see Stilton in blocks. And, you know, the natural form coat is the mark of a good Stilton. We've got some a few pictures to talk about the variance and what um, causes that growth in a minute. The next slide just gives you a sense of the three counties. So we're right in the heart of England. That's the best way to describe it. The three shire counties are at the heart of England. You can see there. 
middle distance from the south coast to the Scottish borders and from the east and west coast of the country. Um, Long Clawson, you can see, is almost the centre of the three shire counties. And there you can see a black dot pointing out the village of Stilton, which is very close to the shire counties and approximately just under a third of the way from London to York. And that just shows you an aerial picture of the village of Long Clawson. And to the left-hand side of the picture, you can see the slightly industrial buildings. And we won't apologize, that's us, because we've invested a lot of money into our facilities to allow us to make the cheese to a very high hygienic standard. And you can see to the right of that, the village of Long Clawson. So, you know, we work hand in hand with the residents of the village and complement the village and they're hugely proud of the fact that we're the biggest producer of Stilton in the world and it comes from their village. So we talked about the certificated trademark um, and being registered in the UK in the 1960s and from that registration we've applied to countries around the world which includes North America, USA, Canada and we've got certificated trademarks now registered in 23 principal trading countries around the world. So, you know, it's our job to manufacture it faithfully to that recipe and also protect the heritage of the product so we can share it with everybody in this country and around the world. Um, we're not the only producer, um, we're the biggest producer by a long way. We've got about 70% market share and there are a lot of small producers. So. You know, you can be assured if you buy a piece of cheese from a retailer in America and it says Crop or Bishop or, or Colson Bassett on it um, or Tuxford and Tebbers, that cheese will be made exactly the same. Every single manufacturer faithfully fosters that recipe and we all get independently audited by an external organisation two or three times a year without any prior notice to make sure that every one of us follows those recipes, we don't deviate, and we protect the heritage of Stilton. So if you buy anything that's got the certificated trademark and says Stilton cheese, you can be assured it's come from one of the six licensed dairies. And just moving on, um, we talked or saw on the video that we've moved on from the 500, 800 gallon vats. You saw the larger vats on the video. Those vats now hold about 4,500 English gallons or close to about 5,200 US gallons and what we've realized over the years by making it into larger batches we can standardize and we can harmonize the things we do throughout the process to make our cheese more consistent so rather than from detracting from it it is actually enhanced the quality of the cheese we produce and at the early stage of the process we add the starters to produce the lactic acid and the blue mold, the Penicillin Rep 40, which you saw going in. And we use the same culture that this business used on its first production in 1911 from the same manufacturer of mold. And now from adding the rennet to turn the milk from a liquid to a solid takes about 90 minutes. And then once it's reached a solid state, we very, very gently cut it into half inch cubes, which then allows the separation of curds and mold. And again, on this picture, you can see the larger vats um, and they hold um, 20,000 pounds of milk. Thank you, Michael. After the curds have set, sat and drained very, very gently overnight, so we leave them in the vat, we don't touch them, we allow the curds to, to drain naturally. We found that the least you handle, the least you disturb that curd while it sits in the vat, the better the quality of the cheese. The next morning we very carefully cut it into blocks and then each blocks of a set dimension and we add a set amount of salt. So we dry salt in the block of the curd and then that goes into the cheese mill. And you can just see in the picture there, they're the curd particles and they're all roughly about the size of a walnut, but not consistent in size. So what we want is bigger pieces about the size of a walnut and some smaller pieces so as that naturally settles into the cheese by not pressing it we get fissures or lines or cracks in the cheese and that's where the blue mold will form and grow when we allow oxygen so that cold curd the salted curd 
is put into the cheese hoops and that sits naturally in that hoop for five days being turned every day before it is firm enough to remove the hoop. Yeah, you can see the curd particles there just gently filled into the hoops um, and it takes five days for it to knit together a form to make a cheese. If you try to remove the hoop before five days, the curds will just fall apart. A lot of whey drains, so we get the equivalent of about four pounds of liquid off the cheese. So when we're, we're putting the curds into the, the moulds, it's still very high moisture. It's still about 48 to 49% moisture, the curd, and the salt will squeeze the curd particles and help them knit together. And that moisture will naturally drain during those five days. And it will allow us to bring the cheese together and firm it up so that when we remove the hoop, we've got a cheese that will be freestanding. And again, going back to the old photograph, we still smooth the cheese. Uh, it's important, you can see there, that naturally the cheese comes out of the hoop. It's got an open texture. And if we didn't smooth it, the oxygen would start to get in the cheese and you get blue mold growth within the center or the body of the cheese a lot sooner. We want to be able to control that part of the process and by smoothing it, we can seal the coat and then we can control the development of the blue mold. So what happens in the maturation? We've talked about the hoop is removed and the, the coat is sealed. And then the cheese are put into rooms that are temperature controlled, humidity controlled for another four to five weeks. And all the time they're in those rooms, we've got to keep turning the cheese. The cheese will gradually start to dry out and lose more moisture. And we end up with a cheese that's got around 40% moisture, um, start, having started with something at 48% in the curd coming out of the vats. And at four to six weeks, um, we will then introduce stainless steel needles into the cheese. Um, we do that and repeat that seven days later. And over the process of piercing the cheese twice, we'll introduce 600 holes into the cheese. That essentially allows the dissolved gases to come out of the cheese and oxygen to get into the cheese and move along those tiny little fissures and cracks. And that's what starts to stimulate the growth of the blue mold. And at the end of that process, it takes from skewering the cheese the first time to um, starting to see the growth of the blue mould is usually about 14 days. Um, we have a series of expertly changed or trained cheese makers and those cheese makers uh, at around 14 days will start going along checking the cheese looking for consistent mould growth. They'll be looking at the visual characteristics on the outside of the cheese and once the blue mould has grown to a satisfactory level we will then start grading those cheese to put into another cheese store that is slightly cooler for the next part of our affinage process, which is to allow that raw blue curdy cheese to start to break down to make a soft, creamy, mellow texture. And again, we'll talk about that as we taste the cheese in a short while. We talked about the variants of cheese coats. Um, the cheese coat is simply the yeast and mold in the atmosphere in our cheese rooms growing on the surface. We have very little control of that. It's a key part of the process that we don't uh, introduce artificial coats. So sometimes the year you'll see a bit more yeast growing and the coats might be lighter, golden brown, slightly yellow or orange in colour. And other times of the year you'll see a more white or grey type coat which is a predominance of mould. So the coat is made up of multi layers of yeast and mould growing on the surface of the cheese. Michael. Yeah. So just a picture of what we do when we grade the cheese which is you know very important. We put an iron in and remove the core and the reason I just wanted to spend a minute on this is that you know anybody familiar with cheddars and lots of bulk cheeses may be aware that they will grade one or two cheese from the batch, mark that cheese and say that is an indicative quality score for that product from that batch. 
Stilton, each cheese is an entity in its own right. Everyone is slightly different. You know, out of a vat, we will get up to 280 cheese. Each will be individual. So to ensure the quality to our customer, we will grade every single cheese. So every single cheese will have the core removed. We'll inspect the core. We don't taste it, but we do check each cheese by smelling it for odours. You know, it's very easy to pick up any cheese that might be defective for odours. It tends to be yeast and that, that smell will be pretty obvious by just passing that iron in front of your nose. So, you know, an important part of what we do as an industry is inspect every single cheese and screen out the cheese that don't meet our minimum quality standards. Just moving on just to talk about the product range and how the cheese is linked with each other and then we'll just pause for a second and then move on to tasting some product. So Stilton cheese is our, our core product. Uh, we also make a variant, so on the three pictures at the top, the second one is Blue Shropshire and that is a slight variance on a Stilton, a slight modification of the starter and the process and the addition of a natto into the milk gives a vibrant orange background and a slightly sweeter, more subtle flavour. And what we found is sometimes consumers have got a predetermined prejudice. They won't like blue cheese. And we can normally persuade them to try the Shropshire. And when they try the Shropshire and they find it very pleasant, it's usually then easier to persuade them then to give the blue Stilton a try. In the far right hand at the top is the Rutland Red, and that's always has been intrinsically linked with the manufacturer of Stilton. Stilton, you know, in the early years was produced from spring milk for the Christmas market, and the farmhouse producers would find they'd have milk at certain times of the year they couldn't utilize to produce Stilton. Modern days, we've got storage facilities that allow us to do that. They didn't have refrigeration, um, so they produced a hard, cheese which is called a traditional Leicestershire red is very similar to a cheddar um, more open flaky texture the annatto and it gives it a sweet nutty flavor so most stilt manufacturers would have produced that we're the only stilt manufacturer that still produces a traditional um, Leicestershire red and the two pictures on the bottom we mentioned or I mentioned earlier that Stilton the white Stilton is used for blending. We found it's a very natural bedfellow with sweet flavours like apricots and cranberries and mango and ginger. And yeah, we'll touch on one or two of those when we come to the taste in a minute. So, so what we're going to do now is move through a series of slides and talk about the product and taste the product. And um, I've got some cheese which I'm going to taste and I think Michael I'm not sure if you're just going to interject with me and Martin as we go through these tasting sessions now but we're going to start with the White Stilton. For these talks White Stilton it's quite important for me to talk about White Stilton and I'll hold it up so everybody can see the White Stilton. So the White Stilton is just a piece of blue cheese so it is the blue stilt manufactured product that is 10 days old. So if you went to any of our cheese stores and took what we started out to make a blue cheese, cut it in half, that's exactly what you'd see. You'd see a cheese, it's probably not very hard to see. If I come closer, you'll see it's slightly open textures and fissures and cracks. And that's what we've been looking for in our blue cheese. And over the years, local people realized they liked a young, slightly acid cheese. So. It's very crumbly, it's slightly dry in the mouth, you know, it flakes, it crumbs, and it's got a acid, slightly yogurt flavour. So if you taste the cheese, it's like tasting a natural yogurt. It's got a clean, natural yogurt flavour. And that, as we mentioned, lends itself perfectly for blending with our fruit flavours. So that's what you'd see in a blue Stilton before you started to pierce it to encourage the blue mold to grow. So before anybody asks the question, why doesn't the blue mold grow in the white Stilton? Because we produce a lot of white Stilton. The process is the same with the exception of adding the penicillium rock porti into the cheese. So same starter, same process, same methods of handling the cheese, 
we just don't put the blue malt culture in. So moving on, a young blue cheese, and what do we mean by a young blue Stilton? So, you know, we talked about the graders grading those cheese around 14 days old. So this is a piece of cheese, and I'll hold it up again. This is a piece of cheese that the graders, just navigate to my camera, the graders would have um, probably graded a couple of days ago. So it is very young cheese there. And that gets graded out of our cheese rooms and our cheese rooms are reasonably warm and we move them into cooler rooms. We want to, once the blue mole appears, we want to mature it very slowly because in maturing it slowly, we allow the proteolysis, we allow the blue mole cultures to break the proteins down to give the traditional very smooth, creamy texture. So when you taste this cheese, you cut the cheese again, you know, it's, I hold it up, it crumbles, it, it's crumbly a little bit like the white Stilton. When you taste it, it's still young, fresh. You've still got some of those slightly acidic notes. Um, and sometimes on young cheese, you would expect a little back note of bitterness coming from the blue mold culture. But certainly what you wouldn't be expecting is that cheese to be very soft and creamy and smooth as a mouthfeel because that that cheese typically would be seven or eight weeks old and um, for the US market that's very important what we've done is spent the last 20 years developing a process of shipping the state cheese to the states where we ship them in very carefully controlled temperature conditions so we pick our cheese for our customers at eight weeks old so we're picking a very young very crumbly something we wouldn't expect you to enjoy or sell to your customers but because we pick it at the right age and we control the shipping conditions and correct me if i'm wrong martin we're looking at about three weeks to ship the cheese from the uk to the states um yeah, yeah. on the water on, on the rest yeah that allows that cheese to gradually and slowly mature in transit so by the time it reaches you in america and it moves through the distrib distribution system the cheese is starting to reach optimum flavors and textures that we would encourage you and like you to enjoy eating our cheese so moving on to the mature cheese so what happens what's the difference when you move on to the mature market? very little or no change in the coats whatever coat you've got when the cheese grader grades that cheese you know when we ship it to you when you receive it that coat the external surface of the cheese will be pretty much the same the single biggest change between that young blue cheese and a mature is going to be the texture. It's going to be smooth and creamy because the proteins have started to break the cheese down. You've got a little bit of proteolysis in the early stages and that breaks it down to give a nice smooth creamy mouthfeel. And it also starts to balance the flavour. So you get a beautiful balance of flavour between salt and the umami flavour of the Stilton. So, you know, a really, really good Stilton cheese is very hard to define a very single flavour characteristic. It's usually it's a rounded, balanced flavour of the blue umami and the salts and the other characteristics. And one of the big things, and I'll do it on my cheese board and just show you, is because the cheese is broken down, you can get the knife and you can just run through the knife and instead of it being crumbly, it will be nice, soft, creamy, almost to the point you can get a paste. But when you put that into the mouth, you've got that luxurious, soft, smooth, creamy mouthfeel. And the flavors are excellently balanced and there isn't that dominant flavor. So again, Michael, I think you've got some silt in there. I don't know if you want to comment on any of the flavors and the characteristics you pick up on the still. You know, um this is one of my favorite blue cheeses, obviously, in the world. Um, and I love using this in, in teaching because it is probably the most approachable blue cheese because of the creaminess and the flavors. And uh, it does pair up really well. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do with this. And I know at the end that we're going to uh, chat about that. But what I thought would, would be fun is because it's so creamy and all of that, uh, I've actually paired this up with a, uh, 
uh, a biscuit, and this is uh, at Effie's, and it's an oat biscuit, which uh, I really wanted something that would be uh, complimentary, and I think oats uh, work really well. And then uh, uh, this Taste Elevated Booze Time Cherries, which is uh, cherries soaked in brandy, amaretto, thyme, brown sugar. So it's really a, a wonderful flavor characteristic. They're um, uh, very, the, the small uh, cherries, but it's just so, so crazy rich um, in the flavor. And I thought that would be really fun uh, with this. And so uh, it's obviously magnificent on its own, but also being able to, uh, I guess, uh, uh, dress it up a little bit. And, um, you know, the creaminess of the cheese alone is, is just amazing. I just really love the mouthfeel and uh, the little bit of saltiness, which works well with, I think, the sweetness of the cherries. And beverage-wise, uh, here in Tampa, we have uh, uh, Cigar City Cider and Mead, and they do a traditional golden English dry style that is absolutely fabulous. Uh, with, uh, uh, with, with the cheese. So that's where I'm going with it. Michael, yeah, just to, just to pick you up, very, some very interesting thoughts there, Michael. So, you know, our thoughts back on this side of uh, the pond would be that um, you said dress it up, I think very much um, complements, balances and complements, not necessarily dresses the stilton up. And I think your choice of the the chutney with the cherries is excellent. We always find anything with a little bit of sweetness balances superbly with the bitter notes. The two are superbly complementary. You know, the Stilton enhances the, the sweetness of the cherries and vice versa. And we drink, you know, in the UK and certainly when we've traveled in the States, people know that Stilton is very synonymous to drink with port. And he's absolutely superb with a fortified wine whether it be a sweet wine or a port um, because you've got that subtle note of sweetness the same as your chutney but you're absolutely right with people nowadays stepping out from tradition and looking for something different and i would challenge you and i can see some cans behind and i guess we'll touch on that in a short while is there's some fantastic traditional craft beers coming through some of them with subtle sweet back notes and they balance very well with Stilton. And we've got a craft brewery now, very close to the dairy, about four miles away. Been spending some excellent time experimenting then with some dark beers, some fortified dark beers, some stout beers, and they just work very well. But, you know, everybody's palate's different. And, you know, our overall message is enjoy the Stilton. And if you enjoy a particular drink or a chutney or way of eating it or just uncrusted bread, is there to be enjoyed but you know you can experiment and have a great deal of fun trying different things and finding what suits your palate but in principle you tend to find something with a slightly sweeter note does balance the bitter notes in Stilton very well so you know I think your choice is excellent I'd probably go and we can get them in the, the UK I'm not sure about the States you can get some medium ciders with just that subtle sweet note um running through it and they sometimes I think for my palate balance is better than a dry cider but certainly you know try experiment and enjoy would be our message and spend many hours of good fun trying different drinks and combinations with the cheese. I was just going to say that uh, when you are looking at the variety of uh, the differences in blue cheeses and how different each one is um, this is a excellent way of being able to get your feet wet on talking or tasting authentic blues because there's so much that this brings. When, when you talk about, when you say blue, a lot of people don't realize that we're talking about a really interesting mushroom flavor, not, yeah. uh, not as much as the saltiness as you have with those um, Danish blues where this is just has a nice balance, but the predominance here is on the creamy buttery flavor. And I think yeah. that's what works so well with the cherries and the, the sweet oat biscuits. Yeah, that's an interesting point you brought about the mushroom. Um, 
that's a little bit from the, the moulds that you'll find in blue cheeses. It's a little bit more evident on Stilton because it's quite subtle and balanced. It tends to be hidden on other blue cheeses. And if you taste the blue cheese, and just let it linger in your mouth a little while without um, putting any compliments with it. Just towards the back of your mouth here, if you think about it and you close your eyes, you will pick up, as Michael said, that very, very subtle um, chestnut mushroom flavour at the um, side and back of your mouth. Um, and, you know, you can pick that up on Stilton because it is more balanced and more subtle. You know, some of our, our competition coming out of Europe, if you think of things like Roquefort, you know, they have singular kind of very dominant flavours with rock for you tend to pick up quite a salt note you certainly pick up they they use milk that's made from the cheese so they tend to be a used milk flavour with salt Danish blue tends to be hugely salted the dominant flavour in there is is salt um, if you look at some of the Italian blues they've got a different starters different complex and they've got quite a sweet almost sweet sickly note but they they tend to have one single very dominant flavor where stilton tends to be quite balanced and quite subtle and each time you taste it if you think about it you usually think mm, i can pick up a slightly different flavor or note on the cheese so we're not tasting blue shropshire we said we just touch on it so the blue shropshire is made very similar to stilton but we just slightly alter the starter cultures and add the annatto so it gives a strong different visual marker to people and then it's interesting we do sell it into the states and if people are reluctant to try stilton cheese i would just say you know it's an easier way it's a softer way to encourage people to just try a blue cheese and you know and if you're a lover of blue cheese and you want to encourage other people to do it taste it yourself Go for the slightly older cheese. It's counterintuitive. I know on cheddars you might go for a younger kind of milder cheese rather than an intense, stronger cheddar. But with Stilton and blue cheeses, they get softer, creamier and more mellow as they age. Just, just pick that soft, creamy, mellow cheese. And um, usually, as Michael said, if you offer it with some uh, compliments that are slightly sweeter, people usually find that actually pleasantly surprised when they chase the blue cheese. Here we go. So Cotswold. So this is um, one of our better selling cheeses in the States, I believe, Martin. We sell it's more than better. It's the, uh, it's the biggest selling cheese. Um, yeah. Cotswold can only be made by Long Claws and Cotswold brand is, as you can see on the top, it is trademarked. And, and there's only Long Clawson that make Cotswold. So uh, it's the it's a brand recognition. Some a number of people think Cotswold is just a generic name for double Gloucester mixed with chive and onion. Um, but Cotswold is only made by Long Clawson. We take a great deal of care with the base cheese and using the finest ingredients, but it's a very, very popular cheese in America. Great for for cooking with, it's wonderful in uh, crumbled in, in an omelette or baked potatoes, it works well with nachos, uh, and it's a great entry level cheese for, for a blended cheese product. Some of the best double Gloucester produced in the UK and blend it uh, with good quality chives and onion and it gives a superb savoury cheese and it is, you know, our biggest, strongest seller in the US, so we couldn't talk to you today as uh, Customers in the US without mentioning Cotswold and you know probably one of the single biggest accolades of a successful cheese is that everybody out there wants to copy our cheese because it is so successful so you know always you look for the word Cotswold then you know it's authentic and it's um, come from Long Claws and, and it's not a me too copy but it is a very soft creamy cheese that we spend quite a lot of time make sure we get a perfect balance between the onions and chives to give that superb savoury cheese for a cheese board and the reason we mentioned it was still to not only is it a big seller in the states but it balances perfectly on a cheese board with Stilton so if you was looking to create a cheese board I'm sure you'd be looking for maybe a soft cheese from France a brie a camembert you know, Stilton goes without saying, I won't be here today without saying that Stilton's a must on the cheese board, but we would say take one of our sweet flavoured 
White Stiltons and also Port either the Huntsman or Cotswold. And we're going to talk about the Huntsman in a minute as a nice savoury cheese to go on that cheese board. So it is, you know, a nice orange cheese flecked with the onions and chives that gives a perfectly balanced savoury flavour. I think one of the other points to mention, Kim, is that all the blended cheeses that we produce do not contain any form of additive or emulsifier or preservatives or any form of artificial ingredient. I know it's quite important now in the consumer's eyes, but uh, you know, all we use is literally freeze dried chives and onions and double Gloucester. Uh, and the same with the, with the fruit. We're not using fruit that's dried with sulfur dioxide. We're not using potassium sorbates. So it's about as natural as it can, as it can be. We, we think that's very important in this day and age. Uh, we produce what we we would term in the UK as clean deck cheese. It's very simple. We don't put those additives in. And basically, our challenge would be that you should be able to produce the Cotswold, the same as us, just by going to the supermarket, buying a piece of double Gloucester, moving along the aisle where the spices are and buying some dried onion and chives. If you can't, buy it from the supermarket. If you're not happy to buy it, to use it as an ingredient at home, we wouldn't include it into any of our cheeses. And that goes with the white Stilton. So, you know, pure white Stilton and pure apricots, nothing else. We, you know, we challenge ourselves. You need to be able to walk the aisle of a reasonably sized supermarket and be able to buy the ingredients that you'd use happily at home as a cooking ingredient. Um, Let's move on to the Huntsman, which is the, well, the next actually, one I think you've got. I have, I have a little bit of pairing with this. You know, this has been one of, one of again, one of my favorite cheeses. Uh, when teaching this in the classroom, one of the things that you have to say is that uh, this is a very versatile cooking cheese because these additives in here really make a difference. And you could do this, uh, the dressing up a baked potato, you could dress up uh, scrambled eggs, you could you dress up tacos. There's so much that you can do with this, uh, but uh, just by itself, it's so interesting on a cheese board. It's a beautiful looking cheese, so it looks good on the board as well. So you have this, uh, you know, really interesting looking uh, texture to it as well. So uh, I wanted to go a little bit of savory on this. I, I wanted to bring a little bit more of things that, you know, you want to have something that uh, first one, we had a little bit of sweetness. Well, uh, what I did here is that I have a really nice mousse. And this is, uh, uh, this is chicken and pork and a, a little bit of truffle in it. And so um, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to give us the uh, additional flavors, kind of like uh, uh, having a little bit of a sandwich here. And the cheese is going to bring up a little bit more of the tanginess. You know, a lot of people are afraid of, uh, of pâtés or uh, uh, mousses on that. But really, we're talking about a really nice uh, pork and uh, uh, chicken blend that is absolutely fantastic and really easy uh, to, you know, to pair up with. And then to be able to hold this, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty dense. So uh, I'm using the three little pigs. Uh, both of these are three little pigs. Uh, and this is the petite toast. And so I'm almost always one of my go-tos for pairing up this, this cheese by itself has been a brown ale. And I've, I've used that for a very long time. And just recently, I realized that uh, it it doesn't really um, uh, bring out as much of the tanginess. So I shifted uh, to a red ale, and this happens to be, a, again, a local brewery where this is a red ale that's also an IPA. So it's a red IPA, and it just brings out more of the tang, brings out more of the onion without really uh, interfering with the clarity of the cheese. I think your um, pairing there is excellent and it, it brings to my mind one of the pairings I like with mature Stilton cheese which an ultimate sandwich for me is really good char roasted beef with Stilton cheese so a bit like you've gone for a pate with that cheese 
with Stilton, a really soft, creamy blue Stilton with a very nice, rare roasted beef with a bit of char on the outside. Makes an excellent balanced sandwich. Yeah, you literally could uh, take a piece of toast and uh, uh, slather on the uh, mousse um, and then shred up some of this cheese on it. And it, it is just fabulous in flavor. Uh, it's so rich, creamy. Uh, I, I love the tanginess. I love the freshness of the onion and chive. And it's not, not overpowering. And that's one of the things about getting a blend right. Now, obviously, you guys have been doing this for a very long time. But uh, in America, we have a lot of companies that have got into flavoring cheddars and other cheeses. And uh, they can be overhanded. In other words, you don't taste the cheese at all. You taste the blend. And here, it's absolutely perfect. The double glossier comes out it's just so creamy and buttery. And then you pick up a nice... Uh, um, uh, onion and chive. Just so well done. One of the arts of blending cheese, Michael, is to select the ingredients on their strength or flavour and to match that with the base cheese. So if you're going to use a, a, a chilli cheddar, for instance, if you use a mild cheddar, the chilli will overpower it. So you've got to get the balance and the strength of flavours between the the various cheeses that you decide to use for blending and the ingredients. And it's a real art to get that because we always believe that you shouldn't have one flavor that dominates the, the blended cheese. So you need to be able to taste the, you know, the double Gloucester and the chives and the onion or the sweetness of mango and ginger, which Kim will talk about in a minute. But that's really important. It's a real art to blending cheese. People just think you can take some cheddar and stick a handful of ingredients in it and off you go. Um, but we, over the years, we've tasted some dreadful stuff in here. Absolutely shocking. Um, but it's, it is an art. And we, we spend months developing uh, blended cheese because when it's in the pack and it's sat there for a few weeks, the flavours alter as well. So you've got to do it throughout the life of the cheese to ensure you get a consistency. So the, the Huntsman, again, it's a very, very popular cheese that uh, we make and sell in America and you know we talked about the nice creamy subtle flavor of double Gloucester we balance that by making a cheese and hand crafting it so we cut um, the thin slices of double Gloucester we rig the Stilton into thin layers and then we hand form that into a layered cheese of double Gloucester with the Stilton and you get a really nice and balanced cheese with a slightly soft, subtle flavours, sweet flavours coming from the double Gloucester with a slight bitterness coming from the Stilton. And that, that makes for an ultimate piece of cheese that looks very eye appealing and interesting to eat to put on a cheese board. So I think again, Michael, you've got some um, interesting pairings on the side on your table with the uh, Huntsman. Just show people to hold it so you've got the nice even layers of Stilton and Double Gloucester. So, you know, they're evenly balanced. So you've got the same amount of Stilton and, and Gloucester in the cheese. Creating pairings are about an, uh, knowing the characteristics of something and knowing why it would work to be able to work together. But sometimes when you have multiple characteristics that play in there, trying to find something that's going to work together can be challenging because you have, uh, I wouldn't say opposites, but um, you know, you have a very distinct difference between the double glossier and the Stilton. So when I was working with this, I was trying to think about, you know, what would be a good uh, complement, And what I've used before for uh, blues is uh, uh, being able to use a, a fig chutney or a fig spread. And so that's what I decided to do. The Perseverance Society does this amazing fig spread. No sugars, no nothing like that. And I really thought that it would be fun to be able to put these two together. But I really was guessing on uh, whether or not they would actually work together. 
it actually brings all these together because as we know with the Stilton, we like to have a little bit of sweet fruit that goes along with it. Uh, with the blue or with the cheddar, we like to have a little bit of uh, fruitness, uh, not as much like apple going on there. So I think a fig fit right in between. Uh, it has a little bit of sweetness. It has a little bit of the uh, uh, fruitiness to it. And then beer wise, um, I, I need something because there's so many flavors here. I need something to clean my palate. So I chose Highland Brewery out of Asheville and this is their Gaelic Ale. It's like a pale ale, but it's got more maltiness to it. So you get the cleaning and you get a little bit of maltiness. The fig is an interesting choice that works superbly well with Stilton. So that's why I think it, it's picking up nicely with your Huntsman. But also traditionally in the UK, people would try things like quince paste as well. That's, that's really nice. I'm not sure whether that's readily available in the States, but quince paste works well. And equally, you don't have to go to preserves and chutney and paste. If you get a really ripe, juicy pear, fresh pear, just slice the pear to eat with the cheese. And sometimes when you're looking for a palate cleanser, just a slightly tart, really crisp apple does the job. So sometimes just the fresh fruit on its own, a few nuts, a few dried apricots actually will do the same as some of those the compliments that you picked today. You know, and again, what I said earlier, it's half the fun is trying, experimenting, sometimes it doesn't work. And then sometimes you're really surprised that you hit across a combination of cheeses and different things that are absolutely superb for your palate about where the name Huntsman came from. And his version of it was uh, that uh, in the mornings they would get up early for uh, the hunts and head on out. And then in the uh, afternoon, the, they would break and have uh, Stilton and Double Gosher. Yes, yeah, pork pies, they would take pork pies. Uh, they'd all be things that somebody could um, take and they could pretty much snack on without getting off the horses or venturing too far before they went off on their, their hunt again. So, you know, pretty, pretty much the origins are, as you've described them, Michael, it would be people taking things that were nutritional, uh, filling and easy to carry out into the field. Yeah. Yeah. His, his story included, uh, well, Freddie was talking about, uh, uh, you know, these horses are, uh, quite large and, uh, starting off was uh, a little bit of uh, courage of uh, drinking before they headed off. So the lunch was uh, well, really well received. Yeah, they would always have a steric cup of some port before they started. They, yes, as we all know, piece of Dutch courage before they started going, jumping across all the hedges and ending up in the ditches. And I think if they came off the horse, it uh, gently softened the blow as they hit the ground as well. <laughs> So Rutland Red, before we move on to the blended cheeses, it was always made by the stilt manufacturers. We're the only ones that continue to make it. It's an air dried cheese. It's very traditional. It never sees a vac bag. It dries out, it firms up and it has a very, very flaky texture, but it is sweet and nutty in flavour. And, you know, I'd encourage you, if you ever get the opportunity, you ever see it, to try some traditional Rutland Red. It is completely different to a Red Leicester cheese because it's air dried, it's got a traditional coat, and it has a different flavour and texture. Michael, if you'd like to just move on to the blended cheese, the next one. White Stilton and Cranberry, one of the very, very traditional cheeses. Now one of the best selling um, blended cheeses in the UK. The UK palate's taken to that kind of very sweet, tart cranberry flavor. Um, so what we have found as people have started to enjoy cranberry in all forms in the UK, whether it be a cranberry chutney or a preserve or a cranberry juice or just eating dry preserved cranberries, is that it balances really well with the white Stilton. So you, you get that slight lactic tangy cheese. You get a subtle sweetness initially coming from the cranberry when you try it. And then there's just a lingering 
tartness coming from the cranberries at the end, but it is quite a clean, refreshing cheese on your palate. Why still an apricot? Don't jump to the mango and jump G yet. And an equally strong selling cheese is the white Stilton and um, apricot. And again, I think the um, balance of flavour and sweetness that you get from the apricots. You don't necessarily appreciate And I've tried the dried apricots we used before we put in the cheese, but then just putting it in the cheese seeds to bring out the sweetness of the apricot. So you get that nice, again, clean lactic tartness from the cheese and a real nice sweet back note from the apricot at the end of the eating the cheese. This goes back to Long Clawson trying to produce a cheese for quite a number of years ago. We produced a mango cheese and it wasn't particularly successful. We still make it for some customers. Um, we produced the white Stilton and ginger and what we found is that it was very fiery. You got an intense fiery heat from the ginger. You know, as Martin said, you know, we don't give up, we try and we persevere and you know, one of our development teams said, well, actually, we've probably got a really nice balance here between the two sweeter cheese from the mango and the two intense fiery notes from the ginger. And what we actually did was blend cheese and played around with it and got the perfect balance of sweetness coming from the mango and the fireness from the ginger. And when you taste the cheese, you start off, you know, with the lovely tartness coming and tanginess coming from the white Stilton. Then you pick up the sweetness from the mango and almost initially it's a little bit too sweet. And then just as you start to eat it and chew the cheese, all of a sudden it kicks in. You get a fiery heat from the ginger and then as it sits in your mouth, the sweetness and the fire balance out to produce I guess one of our best strong selling blended cheeses and you know if I ever go to a party people always say bring some mango and ginger and it's something people like and you know if you ask people to try it they go mm, I'm not sure about it. it doesn't sound particularly appetizing but once people have tried the mango and ginger you just say nothing you just watch them and you see them keep going back and eating it until it's all gone. So Michael I think you've got some interesting pairings for the mango and ginger. A couple of weeks ago, I had Oliver Turner from Virginia Chutney and Perseverance Society on, and he was talking about different types of chutneys and that, and he said, and, it, and I have this on my YouTube channel, that's a little one minute blurb, but he said if a uh, alien would come to earth and uh, ask what was the most uh, common condiment in the world, uh, what would it be? And he said it would be mango chutney. Um, you know, India is big in, in mango, uh, the southern United States, the Caribbean, and of course, you guys in England. Uh, so, um, you know, he even joked that, well, maybe ketchup, but ketchup was a chutney as well. And uh, so on my post, I had a whole, I got a lot of, a lot of people that come on and go, no mustard is the other thing. But I, I love mango. I think that this is a, a really wonderful uh, balance of flavors. Um, you know, the, the cranberries is always going to be something that we have right around Thanksgiving. You know, it's a great holiday style cheese. And these all look wonderful on a cheese board. So, you know, when I was thinking of pairing this up, you know, uh, there isn't anything I can do. Uh, it, it does it itself. So the best thing that I could think of would be the Effie's, uh, the pecan uh, biscuits, and the cheese. And, and that's, that's, that's virtually it. Um, I really wouldn't want to add anything. I thought about, well, adding some honey to it or doing something like that. But you know what? Everything that you want is already here. So the only thing you need is a good vehicle to take it from the plate to your mouth. And that's what this does. So pairing this is that, again, it does so much on its own that um, uh, I went with just a, a traditional wheat beer. Uh, this is uh, Florida Avenue Brewing. This is their uh, Weiss beer. It's just very, very simple. It's a little bready with a little bit of carbonation. And that's, that's it. Uh, again, 
this does so much. It's already got everything that you'd want to have. And uh, I love ginger. And, uh, you know, I think that that is a underused or un we don't use it enough because it just uh, has so many, I guess, uh, limits in there where you can do with it. But with here, this is absolutely perfect. Mark, it's interesting. They say um, comments on the chat from one of the customers saying that she, she would describe the cheese as slightly cheesecakey to the customers. Um, and, you know, thank you for that comment. Excellent. We would describe it. And also to the point when we talk to some of the customers in the UK, we actually say it makes for a very lazy dessert because if you whip some cream to stiff peaks and actually just crumble this and fold it in and put it onto a biscuit base, you can actually make a really fresh, very tasty, almost instant lazy dessert. So that description of describing a slightly cheesecake, absolutely excellent. Um, way of describing it, I think. Yeah, I think it, um, from my experience, it needs something that's maybe slightly dry um, because it is quite sweet in its own right. But, you know, you're right, Michael, the fantastic thing about cheese is ready to eat. It's literally good to go. But I think one of the biggest mistakes I'd like to get across, particularly with Stilton cheese, is it is ready to eat but it just needs a bit of care and a bit of thought. And as you've demonstrated today, take a little bit of time thinking about the things that you're going to put with the cheese, the people are going to eat with the cheese, whether it's crusted breads or crackers. Uh, but the most important tip for me, single tip, is make sure the cheese comes out of the fridge and it's allowed to sit at room temperature because you're not actually tasting the cheese. A lot of what you get on the cheese, you're actually smelling the volatiles. Allow your cheese to breathe and come to room temperature to truly, truly get the best flavour and texture when you consume it. It's the single biggest tip I can get to anybody. Pairings are very individual. People have different palates. You'll decide what you really like and what you enjoy. But make sure you allow your cheese to breathe. Come up to temperature. We've just gone through extensive pairings. Um, they're just in summary, you know, the Stilton Huntsman, the Cotswold are, are savoury, quite robust flavours. So when you pair them with drink, think of something that's got a slightly sweet note, you know, some superb craft ales with subtle sweetness coming through, the ciders we talked about. Very traditionally, you can't go wrong with it, you know, but a lot of younger people want to steer away from traditional things. Would be something like a Taylor's 10 or 20 year old port or one of their fine tawny or vintage. You know, I pick Taylor's, it's something we're familiar with, it's something that we've tasted with our cheese and know it goes very well. But, you know, step out of the comfort zone as Michael's done today and try one of those craft beers and sweet ales. And um, as he said, there's some fantastic products out there that work equally well. Um, and when you think of still, don't just think it's a cheese board cheese. It's very versatile. It's got that beautiful, savoury, umami flavour. And as an in cooking ingredient, a tiny piece of Stilton goes a long way and adds a subtle balance to a lot of dishes. And I think there's a couple of slides we'll just flick through to give an idea, but I went on the internet and you could do that equally well. And there's lots of ideas from different people who've tried Stilton and come up with some superb recipe ideas. But, you know, think about pastas or soups or risottos. It just lends itself to anything. Pizza, you know, still was a perfect cooking ingredient. And we'll just flick through the slides, just a couple of things, simple dip. Get some mayonnaise, crumble some superb mature Stilton. You know, you can flavor that how you want. You can just have the mayonnaise in Stilton. You know, at home we like to just put a few dashes of Tabasco in it and just serve that with some simple um, vegetable um, accompaniments like celery, calories, you know, soups, broccoli and still is very traditional in the UK. I think I've seen it in the States, but equally I've traveled to Germany and was pleasantly surprised to be presented with cauliflower and Stilton soup, which worked absolutely well. And recently I've seen a recipe that came from the States. Somebody developed a pear and Stilton and was serving it as a chilled soup in the hot months.
So, you know, be adventurous, try it. It does lend itself to lots of different uses. And without a doubt, one of my favorites, we've got traditional English sottish, which I know you can buy in the States because I've got friends in the States and there's an English butcher in Texas and he makes English sausage. You can buy them online and he ships them all over the States. Um, but the Stilton and mash make, get a really good potato, something with flavor, make the mash how you like it. A bit of cream, bit of butter, but just fold in. Don't cream it so it disappears. Just fold in some chunks of Stilton just before you're gonna serve it. So the heated potato just softens that Stilton. And when you eat the, the mash, the Stilton savoriness comes through and complements your dish. And that works equally well with steaks. You know, you can take a baked potato, scoop it, you know, crumble your mashed Stilton, just put it in, flash it in the oven and do a twice baked potato and serve that with a very good steak. Um, ultimately, you can't go wrong by melting Stilton on a burger. It just is probably the best of compliments and there's lots and lots of different ways you can serve a burger. But if you want to just try and have the ultimate burger, try your Stilton on the burger. And finally, uh, we talked about the Rutland Red. Um, I know macaroni cheese is almost an institution in the States like Stilton is in the UK, but if you ever see any Rutland Red, it makes for the best macaroni cheese you're ever going to taste in your life. You know, Stilton is very versatile. You can use it in lots of ways. Don't think about it just as a cheese board cheese. But at the end of the day, Stilton will make any cheese board special and any special occasion absolutely fantastic. So if you want to make, you know, a family occasion, any occasion, a memorable occasion, find the ultimate piece of Stilton and you'll get fantastic feedback. Thank you for taking your time out today to listen to me talking about my passion about Stilton cheese. Hopefully some of that's rubbed off on you. I think Michael's going to leave some contacts for Martin and myself, and we're very happy. If people have got questions, we'll email. But if um, anybody's got questions, I'm happy to hang on with Michael for a minute or two and try and answer your questions. So I'll pass back to you, Michael. All righty. Well, you know, I have to say that I've known you guys for a long time, and I've been through several of the uh, seminars and, and, and educational events you've done. And this is probably the most thorough um, re presentation of really getting to know more about the cheese, the history, uh, their farms and that, you, that I've ever seen. So, and it was nice to be able to taste through the products. I, I'm very happy that uh, here in Tampa, it was very easy to be able to find the cheeses. Uh, they were available at two locations here uh, two different brands. So it was uh, really nice to be able to, uh, you know, just walk in, pick up the cheese and, and be able to uh, taste along with you guys. So I'm really happy with that. So is there anything you'd like to say? Uh, I know, Martin, you didn't uh, uh, really get a lot to say here, but uh, have something you'd like to leave us with? Well, I've just been reading the comments on the uh, question and answer page. Um, Erica's asking about, well, she's, first of all, she said thank you for your, your time today. I'm, I'm delighted you've, you've joined us, Erica, so thank you very much for bearing with us. But uh, you're asking us about personal pairings. Um, personally, mine would be Blue Stilton, but I actually like Stilton um, with a sweet white Sauterne, um, suitably chilled um, on a Graham's Cracker biscuit and mm -hmm. I put a tiny little bit of honey on it because I just think that's perfect for my personal palate. And, and my, my personal um, pairing probably couldn't be a bigger contrast with Martin. You know, I love a really good baked jacket potato, long and slow so the skin's superb and crispy. Then um, take the potato out, just cream it up with butter. Um, and put some Stilton back into it. Just give it a, a couple of minutes in the oven just to soften the Stilton and then put one of those really nice sweet chutneys on top of it and serve it with an absolutely stunning honey baked ham. And 
I always drink that. I love traditional ales. I go for a, one of the real more intense, dark, um, stout type ales with that. So two completely different um, views on that. And I think, you know, as we said, everybody's palate's different. And part of the fun is the adventure of trying different things and not getting put off occasionally when you try something and it doesn't work. Just move on. You'll, fi you'll find the perfect pairing for your palate. I want to thank you too for uh, you know taking the time and uh, especially uh, over the last couple of days where we've worked uh, you know putting things together and taking the time to be able to have the proper uh, materials and uh, information and all that. I, I really greatly appreciate that and um, love the love your cheeses and looking forward to one day being able to uh, uh, get together and. Like I said, uh, we'll do something uh, at the International Cheese Awards and uh, maybe gin, maybe uh, port, maybe, you know, something. Thank you, Mark, and thank everybody for taking the time to listen to Martin and myself this afternoon. Yeah, indeed, Michael. Look forward to doing it again sometime. Thank you. Absolutely. You guys take care and uh, be safe, and uh, we will talk with you soon. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Michael. Bye. Bye-bye.